I am so thankful that our paths are crossing this morning as we come together to wonder and to worship. We have a few awesome things to talk about in this form of announcements of welcome, and then we'll get to that good work of doing worship together. First, there is wedding flowers, as you can see up here, because we get to celebrate with Bob and Sandy Wynn about the marriage of their granddaughter, Evelyn Saunders, to Michael Head yesterday, and the flowers are up there in their honor. Congratulations to them, and we have prayers and blessings for a long life of happy marriage. Also, I have an announcement that's on my phone, and it's sitting over here, and I want to get the details right. Because there is an RSVP that those of us who have children uh, ages fifth grade and under need to get right. So I'm going to get those details right. My apologies for the delay. August 27th on Sunday, there's going to be a pool party at Canterbury Recreation Association Pool, which is on Pump Road, from 5 p.m. till 7 p.m. And pizza and dessert and drink, or pizza and drinks will be provided. Please bring a dessert or side. But we have to let Laura Thompson or Lauren Everick know by Wednesday the 23rd, so we can give an approximate number to the pool and also to make sure we have enough people to make it um, something that we want to do. So please let Laura or Lauren know by Wednesday the 23rd if you're going to come to this pool party. Again, this is for families of children through, uh, I was going to say rising fifth grade, but as of tomorrow, it is just the word fifth grade. So as guess what? We're going to bless some backpacks today too. Lastly, you'll see some guests up here in the choir loft. We are really, really excited to be joined by the Richmond Shape Note Singers. Um, this is a wonderful group who I've enjoyed getting to hear warming up and practicing this morning. Uh, you'll see some familiar faces up singing with them. Thank you to Richard for extending this invitation and uh, for making this connection. And by the way, you'll see, you can read a little bit about them in the back of your bulletin. But the most important part is when they rehearse, because if you're like, wow, I really want to go hang out with them, they would love to have you come join singing with them. So with all of that in mind, yay, God, yay for the things God is doing here at Grace Baptist Church as we all get to worship now, maybe later. Let's do this together. Amen.
I invite you now to rise in body or spirit and to join in our spoken call to worship and the opening hymn to follow. Our God is compassionate. She doesn't leave us in our suffering. We maintain justice because we know God's deliverance will be revealed in time. God invites all to worship and join in love. The foreigners who join themselves to God to minister to him, to love the name of the fount of justice and to be his servants and hold fast the promises of God will be brought into God's holy spaces. For God declares, my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. I will gather the foreigners, the outcasts, the forgotten. All will be my people and I will be their God.
be seated. If you are a student or an educator or work in the school system and you have brought a backpack or your school supplies or your work bag to be blessed, will you please come forward? So we're doing this a little earlier than normal this year because school's going back earlier. So it's so nice to see all of these faces, some of them we haven't seen in a while because of our busy summer schedules. So we're going to do this blessing together that's in your bulletin. And then I have some goodies for all of you. We have stickers and pins and backpack tags, um, but we also have blessings. So I have one that's for educators, and then these are for our elementary schoolers, and these are for our middle and high schoolers, okay? So if you'll join me in the blessing of the backpacks. God of fresh starts and new beginnings, we bring ourselves, our big feelings, and our backpacks to you. In our backpacks, we carry blank pages, sharpened pencils, and pointy crayons. And in our hearts, we carry big feelings, unanswered questions, and hopeful expectations. There are endless possibilities of what this new year might bring, of what we might learn, who we might meet, and who we might become. God, our friend, who is always with us, be with us through it all. Be with us as we ride the bus. Be with us as we walk. Be with us as we buckle seatbelts, zip up jackets, and tie shoes. However we get there and whatever we wear, bless this journey into something new. For the grown-ups going back to school, with us, God, be with them too. Thank you for our teachers, helpers, caregivers, and leaders, and for all they do to help us learn and grow. God, our friend who's full of wonder, fill their hearts and bless their hands. Amen. Okay, we don't go in there. Very good job.
Please join me for the call to stewardship. All are invited to give and all are invited to receive. As stewards of God, we will do our part to make sure no go hungry. So
A reading from Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1, following with 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Let us pray. Loving God, as I often say, you bless us with many gifts, including four unique seasons. Currently, we are in the heat of summer in August, a time when things naturally slow down in all aspects of life. Soon, however, things will pick back up again as students head back to school, fall activities are planned, and life becomes more chaotic. It's easy in this chaos to lose focus on important things, such as our own health and needs, as well as the needs of those around us. The change in seasons and the excitement that comes with it does not stop you, loving God, from continuing the work of addressing problems at both an intimate level and global level. As your, as your children, we all play a small part in that service to others while also fulfilling life's responsibilities and taking care of ourselves. As we strive to provide compassion to those sick or grieving within our own church family, or compassion to those in other cities, states, or countries, remind us to provide self-compassion, no matter the season we are in, in order to continue in your footsteps. Amen. Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Jesus left this place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, Is it not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs? She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Won't you join me in prayer? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be good and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Last month, a group of us traveled to Tennessee to join Be the Neighbor in their work supporting nonprofits making a difference in the lives of the unhoused population in Nashville. I was excited for this trip for many reasons. In all honesty, one of them was to figure some things out for myself. When I was in seminary living in Waco, I worked for a nonprofit that did a lot of work with our homeless neighbors there. I hadn't realized it, but that work gave me a reference point. And after moving to Richmond, I never really figured out what that looked like here. Not only did I miss it, but I'd forgotten what an integral part of participating in the work of housing justice is to what I believe about the love of God and my calling. I didn't have the words to describe this until very recently, but while in Nashville, I was reminded why this matters so much. Our site coordinator, Catherine, explained to us that the greatest work of advocacy that we could do is to see everyone as our neighbor and to see all of our neighbors as fully humid and fully beloved by God, especially the neighbors who are different from us, who we've gotten used to overlooking. This week away was such a powerful learning experience for all of us, and I think in our gospel lesson in Matthew, we see a powerful learning experience for Jesus too. Personally, this is a hard text for me to read. I think that's because the way Jesus behaves is so out of place with what I know about him and his ministry. Previously in Matthew, he heals a servant of a Roman guard. He no takes notice of the blind, deaf, mute, of children, of women. <coughs> And he feeds and heals crowds of people without taking into account who they are or where they come from. So why does he ignore this woman when she first asks him for healing? Why does he dismiss her and call her a dog? Why does he look down on her and treat her as though she's less than because she's a Canaanite, a Gentile, a non-Jewish outsider? <coughs> Sorry. I think in asking these questions, it would help to understand more about the Gospel of Matthew. This Gospel was written with a Jewish audience in mind. Throughout the whole thing, there's a focus on the kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom, drawing near and what that looks like. In this Gospel, more than any other, Jesus challenges <clears throat> the Jewish religious establishment and criticizes the Pharisees and Sadducees. In fact, this passage is sandwiched between one of Jesus' critiques of religious leaders and another account of Jesus healing a crowd of people. And this story <clears throat> doesn't appear in any other gospel at all. Okay, I'm going to do this backwards from what happened last time. Um, can I ask Aaron to come up here, please? <laughs> knew this was a possibility dealing with illness all week, so thank you for your patience this morning. Hear these words as Lauren's in preparation and guidance from the Spirit. In order to get a sense of this perspective, I actually read all of Matthew leading up to this passage, and here's what stood out to me. Jesus places a responsibility on the Jewish people to stand together so that they might be a testimony to the rest of the word, world of God's love, so that they could bring light and hope and to be a source of justice to non-Jewish people. When the church speaks of a God who numbers every hair on our heads and walks across the waters to get to us, 
I think Jesus wanted us to be able to point to an example, to help make it feel real. Look how they love each other. This is how I love you. I do not think that Jesus initially did not include the Gentiles in this because he believed that they were not a part of God's people, but because he believed that the Jewish people were called to lead the way. And Jesus knows that this could be accomplished far more effectively if they were all united together. And this story about Jesus, I think that he may have become focused on the way things were done instead of being sure how he actually was doing it when he was given the chance. This is a reoccurring challenge in the early church. For those who were raised Jewish, we see through Paul's letters that Peter continues to struggle with this long after Jesus' ascension. We also see how many questions Paul answers about Jews and Gentiles living in the community together. While this may seem like a simple thing to us, there was so many cultural differences between the two groups that made living in community with one another really difficult at times. Maybe it would have been easier if all the Jewish people had gotten on board and the good news had been shared in the right order. The Jews hearing and believing first and then the Gentiles falling in second. Maybe that would have been less messy. But something I know about God's plans is that God is not as concerned about the mess as we are. God does not choose the easiest way to be in community with one another. God chooses the most authentic way for us to be in community, which may also be the messiest way. But it's in this mess, it's in the relationships and in the connecting and the figuring it out that we are changed for the better and that our capacity for love expands. I think what makes us uncomfortable about this story is how we recognize ourselves and Jesus' behavior. I know this is part of what makes me feel uncomfortable. We remember the times when we ignored those asking for help And when we forget to see them as equally human as ourselves, someone we can relate to and connect with and feel compassion for. What is remarkable about this story is how Jesus allowed this woman's faith to transform his perspective. Not only did this result in the healing of her daughter, but it also resulted in a shift in Jesus' own priorities in his ministry. I think this is a testament to how relationships expand our perspectives. We must always be careful in counting out anyone from God's community. As soon as we feel like we know who is in and who is out, it is then that God will remind us how expansive the God, the love of God, really is. Think most impactful thing that we can each do to further our spiritual growth then is to learn to observe the sticky and tricky parts of ourselves and be aware of them without judgment. To be aware of them without shame and without defense. Just noticing and wondering with curiosity, where are my biases? Who have I already counted out? Who am I not fully seeing as someone who is beloved and precious to God? It is only in the safety of compassion and grace that we are able to honestly notice these things and in turn be transformed by the choice that we have to readjust our perspectives. We see Jesus do this. And if you read on, you see the results right away. Jesus continues to heal to feed, and to challenge those in power. In the next chapter, we see that Jesus begins to look ahead. He begins to prepare his disciples for his death and resurrection. Before this, he'd only hinted at what was coming, but now he tells them very clearly that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer and to die so that he could be raised from death into the newness of life. 
this story about the Canaanite woman who came to him for healing was an impactful experience for him. Jesus realized that the Spirit was moving faster and in different ways than he anticipated. Before, he wasn't quite ready for what was next. But the Spirit moves with an urgency that often catches us off guard, Unconcerned about what we think the proper way of doing things is, the Spirit blazes ahead. The Spirit breaks down our preconceived notions in the process. As the theologian N.T. Wright describes it, much of what happens in Jesus' public career, the future keeps breaking into the present, even as here, seeming to catch Jesus himself by surprise. And to communicate this, the Spirit's messenger is an outsider who has more faith than the religious leaders in Jesus' own community. While he's still instructing his disciples to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, God's Spirit places before him a Canaanite woman who shows more faith than even his own disciples. She's already looking ahead to Easter, to a time after Jesus' defeat of death when he instructs his followers to make disciples of all nations. And her persistence, her quick wit, and most of all, her faith changed the mind of Jesus. While in Nashville, the hardest work day for me was on Thursday, our last day. You see, most of our group went to continue unloading furniture, which is where I wanted to go. But that was my plan. Once we started mapping out the logistics for the day, however, it became clear that it did not make sense for me to go back to this place. Instead, I drove several of us to a coffee shop in town where, in their back parking lot, a mobile showering nonprofit called Shower the People had set up for the morning. We were there to help clean the showers in between uses, but once we arrived, we were told that the most important thing that we could do was talk to the folks waiting in line for their showers. This supported Catherine's point about how affirming people's dignity is some of the most impactful work we could do. I'd done things like this before, but this was my first time doing so with several teenagers in tow. And I have to admit that it felt like there was a lot more pressure than the water in the showers. Not to mention, no one knew who we were, and they didn't want to talk to us. Thankfully, Shower the People had thought of this. Maybe we weren't the first ones to experience some initial awkwardness. They had set up a table with beads and elastic string so that we could make customized bracelets for the people and whoever wanted them. I was skeptical at first, but it was so sweet to see all of these adults get excited about having a beaded bracelet mated for them. We paid close attention to what each person asked for. Some of them were very specific. And when they saw that we cared enough to remember exactly what they wanted, their faces lit up with each finished product that they saw. I saw our students making connections with folks they had previously been really nervous to talk to. And I even got to see Lara's Spanish skills firsthand. As we stood there stringing beads together and making connections, I realized that we were likely doing our most important work of the week. Maybe for others, maybe not for others, but definitely for ourselves. So I leave you with this question from N.T. Wright. Which promises of God have we imagined might be fulfilled in the distant future, but ought to be claimed in the present with a prayer and faith which refuses to be put off. I'll ask that question again. Which promises of God have we imagined might be fulfilled in the distant future, 
but ought to be claimed in the present with a prayer and with faith which refuses to be put off. May God reveal these promises to us and may we pursue them with the urgency of the Spirit, even if it is going to be a little messy. Amen. Thank you, Lauren, for those words, and thank you, Aaron, for presenting them. It is uh, wonderful to see in real time the act of being the voice of one you love. So I ask, how do we respond in this messy, complicated world where sometimes we're just saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. What do we want to do? If this is the place where you want to be in the mess with us, if this is a place where you look around and see other people asking why, why? Jesus, tell us why. I tell you, this is a place where we get to do that and I am so excited to get to do with that with you each and every week. I invite you to respond. If you'd like to come up and have that conversation, if you'd like to join us formally, if you'd like to go be baptized at some date, yes because that is the future that we get to respond to. We get to say yes, not down there, but right now. If you're feeling a little bit of that energy, I hope you do that in this moment. We're gonna be, as, by the way, have you enjoyed hearing the uh, Richmond Shape Note singers with me today? Thank you so much. We thought it would be fun to give you a chance to sing with them. So if you look at the back flap of your, of your bulletin, um, I sort of took and, and, and did some hatchet cut and pasting of part of what they are looking at when they sing. And uh, so you have just one line here. I'm not going to ask you to worry about reading all four lines. Um, but I thought we might stand and sing this last time together. They're going to come out and they're going to sing, as you've heard them, go through the shapes, or the, some of us will know those as solfege or solfeggio, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And then they're going to sing through the first stanza, and we're going to join them on stanza two that begins with, he lives to bless you with his love, and stanza three. Let us all make a joyful noise together.
May the God who gathers all of us expand our hearts to love as wholly as our Creator loves us. May this love be a beacon of hope and light of God's love to all of creation. May we lean on each other through the challenges and the messiness of living life together so that we may move forward with the urgency of the Spirit to ready for God's future that is happening now as God's kingdom continues to draw near. Amen. <laughs>